The following interview was conducted with Mark Allen Herm Hermanson, Professor, Hermanson. Professor Emeritus of Biochemistry for the Purdue University of Ohio History Program. It took place on um, Wednesday, January the 28th, 2009, at, in Stewart Center. Uh, the interviewer is Catherine Marquis, the Oral History Librarian. Welcome. Good afternoon. Thank you. And I want to start with, uh, tell us where you were born and your parents in early years. I was born in uh, Crookston, Minnesota, which is a town now of maybe 6,000 people in the northwest corner of Minnesota. Uh, my dad was a farmer, 15 miles south of Crookston. Um, and um, mom, when she did work prior to her marriage, was a school teacher grade school, one-room schoolhouse out in the prairies, uh, and I was born two months after Pearl Harbor, which uh, got my dad, uh, because he was a, both a farmer and had a child, uh, uh, meant that they weren't going to draft him. They, they needed the uh, produce from the farm, so, so he didn't have to go to war. Um, I grew up on that farm. What kind of farm was it? Did you have animals? Or we we had animals. Most yeah. of the neighbors did not because it's very, very rich soil in the Red River Valley between Minnesota and North Dakota. Um, the principal crops were small grains at that time. It's At that time, it was too far north to grow corn or soybeans. Mm -hmm. um, now they have varieties of both that, that actually do work up there. Um, so we grew a lot of barley and wheat. Um, but we did have a flock of sheep and, and uh, hogs and uh, not very many but uh, uh, some hogs and uh, a few cattle, chickens. Um, and I went to a um, school in the village of Beltrami which was six and a half miles from our farm um, that had consolidated the one-room schoolhouses around that area right after World War II uh, into a single school um, where we had four classrooms, two classes to a grade, or two classes to a room, and uh, for eight years, that's the, the format of my schooling there, was a teacher with uh, first and second grade, third and fourth grade, fifth and sixth, seventh and eighth. Um, and, um, so that, that was my primary education. Um, right after the war, that district had made arrangements with the neighboring town, Fertile, Minnesota, uh, to um, have the high school there. And so uh, my four high school years, I was bused from Beltrami to Fertile on what we called the high school bus uh, with the rest of the students from that area. Um, and and uh, went through Fertile High School, and uh, two years ago, three years ago now, I was named a distinguished alum of Fertile High School, Fertile, Minnesota. So it's uh, it nice. was was kind of fun to uh, to see that. Did do what any particular activities that uh, you were involved in when you were in high school? Um, well, was it, and was the, the school a large? The stuff? our class w graduated with sixty nine students which was the biggest class they'd ever had up to that time and probably one of the biggest ones they ever did have. It's back down to about 45 per class now, even though they have a, a circle of, uh, of almost uh, 40 miles di uh, radius around the school to, to draw from. The, the, the whole area has become depopulated because the farms are five to ten fold bigger than they were when I was a kid. Um, uh, so we had um, pretty standard high school education, um, four years of, of science, um, um, it was general science, then biology, then chemistry, then physics, um, four years of mathematics, but absolutely no calculus. Uh, we did have trigonometry. Do you have algebra? Uh, two years of algebra, uh -huh. yeah, right. And, uh, you know, the education was, was not, nothing fancy, but it was good. And, mm -hmm. and one of the uh, 
the teachers in high school, the person that taught the upper um, science courses, particularly chemistry, was a fairly large influence on my life. Um, That, it, that thread there, that comment that you say, others have shared the same thing, but many times their, their high school teacher, for one reason or another, impacted the selection coming to Purdue, their major, what they wanted to do. So, And, and that's really an interesting, uh, interesting point, I think. Well, uh, one of your questions on this uh, sheet uh -huh. um, indicated uh, some kind of... Um, now I'm having trouble finding it, but some kind of uh, event that really had a big impact. All right, an outstanding event in your life. On, yeah. on my life sure. in terms of my profession. And um, that event took place in October of 1957. I was a sophomore in high school, and a world-shaking event took place that month. The Russians put... It's, Sputnik into space and the Americans got extremely concerned about their science and um, by the time so that was October of 57 by the time the summer of 1959 rolled around uh, which was between my junior and senior year of high school um, they had already put in place special programs at various colleges um, that um, were there to inspire um, uh, good high school students uh, to move towards science. And my chemistry teacher, Mr. Vaslix, um, really encouraged me to apply for that program. And I, and I got in, and I spent the summer between my junior and senior year of high school at St. Olaf College. Uh, taking my first year of chemistry. For eight weeks, we covered the whole first year chemistry course. Um, and that really decided where I would go to college, too, in many respects. Uh, but the, you know, the money at that time in terms of scholarships and after-college fellowships for graduate school was just flowing at, at that time. And I don't think I paid for more than one year of college and nothing in the graduate school uh, because I had an NSF fellowship then. And, and, um, and it all was because the United States was really concerned about its status in the world. And somehow we've forgotten that in the last 45 years. But what college did you graduate from then? Did you say no? I went to oh, say no. So you did yeah. go there. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh -huh. And I, I majored in chemistry and mathematics. Mm -hmm. And graduated from there in 1964, um, went to the University of Wisconsin for my PhD in biochemistry, and got that in 1968. Um, proceeded from there to postdoctoral studies uh, with professors Neurath and Walsh at the University of Washington in Seattle for three years. Um, and in 72, jobs weren't all that available um, in academia. And I took a, a non-tenure track position in the College of Medicine for four and a half years in uh, human genetics. In Washington? At Washington. Uh -huh. So I didn't move at that point. So we were in Seattle for almost eight years. Um, and then in uh, 77, I got an invitation to come and look at a job at Purdue University and was offered an associate professorship here um, in biochem and so we moved uh, to Purdue. I got promoted to professor in 1980 and that was pretty good. In 81 the department head and the dean had a disagreement, and suddenly I became department head. <laughs> and so that we moved to the next year. Let me ask you about family. Did you meet your wife while you were in school? Or? Uh, I was at, right at the end of my PhD studies in Madison. I, I met my wife in church choir, and uh, we got married that year that I was finishing. I finished my PhD in June, and we got married in August. And, and I stayed in Madison because of 
funding for the postdoctoral studies uh, an extra six or seven months, and we didn't leave there until the spring of 70, or 69. Okay. Right. So now, we, now you're the head. Well, now I was head uh, for, for quite a while. From 81 to 2001. Um, that, that doesn't really square with my philosophy on such things. I, I don't think it's good for an administrator to be in the same administrative position for more than seven to ten years. And, but one day turns into the next and, you know, you just don't pay any attention to it. And so, um, finally, um, in 98, I was asked to be editor-in-chief of Protein Science, which is a journal of the Protein Society, a society I helped found. Um, and I told the dean at that time I was going to quit. And it was two and a half years later before they filled the position. And so I was uh, had, even from the point of which I told the dean I was going to quit mm -hmm. for, for quite a while. Tell us a little about being the head, about doing recruitment and I mean, working with the students. And that's quite a lengthy time, and you can share some things. Um, well, did the department improve? No, the department has been stable since 1973 in terms of number of faculty. Um, it's, it's been right around 18 plus one, minus one or two, and you know, depending on retirements. Um, I came in as department head at a time, well, let me back up. The biochemistry department at Purdue is officially 75 years old this year. We're going to have a celebration. It split off from agronomy in 1934, and it's in the College of Agriculture, which is typical of biochem departments in land-grant universities. Um, it's always had associated with it the Indiana State Chemist's Office, and until 1965, the department head and the Indiana State chemist were one and the same person. In 65, uh, which was at a time of tremendous growth at Purdue, um, Purdue uh, from the late 50s with seven or 8,000 students went to 25,000 students uh, uh, into the 60s sometime. Um, but in 64 or 5, uh, Bernard Axelrod was asked to be the department head, and he said he would. He was on the faculty, but he would not take responsibility for the state chemist's office. So he, at that time, the two positions were separated. Let me ask you a question about the state chemist. It was in the department, but it was not a, it was a state chemist really reported to Indiana? It just happened to be housed there? I'm thinking of researchers might yeah, ask about that. We have, um, in Indiana, we have uh, a quite a number of agricultural regulatory agencies housed at Purdue. See, Indiana's never had a Department of Agriculture until, what, three years ago? Um, and so the regulatory agencies have not been at, in Indianapolis. Uh, and so the Egg Board is here, and the Indiana State Chemist, and the Animal Disease and Diagnostic Lab is down in the vet school. Um, and there are several others. The meteorology is another. Uh, weather it might be. Weather used to be here yeah. too. Yeah. And so th there has to be a place for organizations in uh, in that. And in the early years between World War II and when Barney took over, um, uh, the state chemist office actually did provide some funds to support graduate students, and grad students could um, actually work for them part time to pay to get a stipend. And while they were going, while they were going to graduate school, that had all ended by the time I came here. Uh, and the state chemists, while they are in the same building as Biochem, uh, really do perform the the analytical functions for feed, seed, fertilizer, pesticides, um, mm -hmm. all those kinds of things. And um, 
and you know, it's it, I always found it a very congenial arrangement and, sure. and not a problem at all. And um, but um, Barney took over his head in '64 and proceeded to hire 12 people, all of whom made full professor at Purdue. Um, and so when I came on his head, Carlson, uh, Don Carlson had taken over from Axelrod in 74 or 5, and he only hired three people. Um, but what that meant was that there were 15 of us all pretty closely uh, bunched in age. Uh, one or so of Axelrod's hires was, what would he be? It would be um, about 10 years, 12 years older than me. And, and so there was not a, it was just a bubble of, of uh, people. And so um, we weren't hiring very much. Um, when I came on, we had one open position, we filled it, um, but then it was a long time until we had another one, and uh, quite frankly, the most important thing, in fact, the only thing that really matters in the long run that a department head does is to hire good faculty, and so I, I guess when all was said and done, I probably hired half a dozen in the 20 years I was head. Um, uh, most of whom are still here. Um, the other aspects. Um, who, who was the dean when you were here? Was that uh, Bernard Liska was oh, okay. the was the dean when I was hired. Uh, he was followed by Bob Thompson, Vic Lechtenberg after that, and Randy Woodson. So I've I've worked for four ag deans, all of them. Excellent. Mm -hmm. we've, we've just had very good deans in that college, and, um, and so that that was that was always a pleasure. The dean, the dean when I came here was Richard Coles, mm -hmm. but when when I went on his head, it was Bernie. Mm -hmm. um, was there any curriculum changes that you made? Well, yeah, I was I was trying to lead into that. Okay. Um, the, the fundamental curriculum for the undergrads in the department still hasn't changed a whole lot from when I first came here. I mean, it's, you keep updating the courses, but the structure of the, of the curriculum, the, what the basic courses are, hasn't really changed significantly. But um, when the year that I came on, um, Don Carlson was working with the head of biology, who at that time was Strother Arnott, and the head of MedChem, who was Heinz Floss at that time, and the head of chemistry, probably was Bob Benkiser at that time, but I don't recall. Chemistry keeps turning over fairly frequently. Um, and they, uh, with uh, really the push from uh, H.E. Umbarger, uh, distinguished professor of biology and National Academy member, uh, put together a program, graduate program, they called the Purdue University Biochemistry Program, PUP, um, which allowed us to take in students that could then work for a variety of professors across the campus. Um, that has since morphed first into um, the uh, BMB, uh, Biochemistry and Molecular Biology graduate program, not a big change from, from the Purdue University Biochemistry program. It's mostly a name change, but, um, but it did expand it a little bit. And then um, several years ago, uh, John Story um, managed to get agreements so that uh, they created the Pulse program, the Purdue University Life Sciences graduate program, which is the, the main interdisciplinary uh, graduate program. Biochemistry by its very nature is interdisciplinary and has only gotten more so when recombinant DNA really took over and 
became the principal research tool. Um, and so it's appropriate that, that the programs actually uh, uh, work across the campus lines. Not the easiest thing in the world to accomplish at a place like Purdue where the departments are so independent. It, it really involves a lot of negotiation all the time. The other thing that's similar to that is that um, in my career, I guess maybe my strength has always been on the analytical side of things. And so I ran some special machinery uh, when I first came here. One of the reasons they wanted me here was protein sequencing. Um, but I've always been engaged with overseeing facilities that have high-end hardware for doing the scientific research. And, of course, those things are useful across the campus. So they also have to be administered across the campus. And, and uh, you've got negotiations with other heads, with other deans, with the provost, and it just goes on All and on. All the parties at the, at the table. That's right. And <laughs> they've never... You see, until recently... We all get served. Until recently, we had very weak graduate school and vice president for research office. They, neither of them had any significant resources in them in the old days. And, of course, if you don't have money, you don't have any influence at a university. And um, that's changing now, but, but there, ha there isn't the kind of central... Um, support and, and discretionary um, uh, funding and, uh, and uh, prioritizing of what's important and not that, that there probably should be. Right. How was the research funding during the time that you were at the Dean? Did it Up and also down. Also a little bit about your research. Up and down. Oh. Um, uh, when I first came here, uh, research funding was not hard to get. Um, by 1980, I was starting to work um, on the biochemistry study section for NIH. Uh, I was on that f pretty much continuously for six years in the early 80s. Um, and in that time, I watched the funding line go from roughly 35% of the grants that came in down to less than 20 and so it, and it got worse, um, it got worse for a while, and then, and then it went back up again. Uh, um, I've always said that you could, if the funding line is 35%, you could look the American taxpaying public in the eye and say, we're not wasting your money. Between 35 and 50, probably means they need to fix something in the proposal. Below 50, forget it. And, um, but it's, right now it's down around 10%, and it, it's really, really nasty. And it's particularly damaging to the young people. Yes. Um, uh, so I really worry about my young colleagues. Several, several have made grades. It's harder now. Yeah. Harder, much harder. Much not harder. harder. Not harder, but much harder. Yeah. All right. No, it's, it's really brutal at the moment. The, um, any de uh, were you on the Senate at any time when you were here, or any committees you'd like to make any comments? Um, well, probably your school, the your school I served for at least 21 um, meetings of the Area Committee for College of Agriculture because I was head, and then I spent a year as Associate Dean uh, after I wasn't head anymore between the time that Randy was bumped up to Dean and and um, when they hired uh, Ramaswamy for our uh, uh, <laughs> Sonny Ramaswamy as, as Associate Dean for Research. He, uh, Randy called me and asked if I would take his old job um, while they searched and I did. So uh, it was at least 21, if not 22 times on the area committee. Um, and in between being head and not serving on the area committee anymore and when I became associate dean that one, one year, um, I 
uh, was appointed to the university promotions committee. So I would say that the most serious committee work that I did throughout my career was looking and evaluating faculty for promotion. Which is a key. It is. Very important. It is. And I have to say that one of the reasons that I've always rated the deans I've worked for as excellent is that they have been very firm about that. Um, in the old days, the ag had a bad reputation of um, sending people up before they really deserved it and also sending up people that shouldn't be promoted. And the time when Liska walked into that office, he started pounding the table and saying, you know, if the department's put forward people that aren't going to make it through the university committee, we're going to stop it here because I'm not going to be embarrassed over there. And the succeeding deans have, have used the same line and to very good effect. Right. It's, it's really made That's a difference. That's really, it's key to the, to the individual as well as to Absolutely. The, uh, in the academic programs mm -hmm. and whatever. Yeah. Right. And so I, that, that was an experience that, while it was hard work and, you know, you were playing with people's lives, it's still one that I treasure because I, I think it uh, is terribly important to, for the institution. Can you make any comments about when you were the associate when you were over there in A? It was just fun. Um, kind of a nice I, transition from. I was. Um, Randy. Randy told me to take care of the on campus duties. Now, of course, AG has responsibilities throughout the state and also federal responsibilities, but. Uh, my assignment as halftime dean or three quarters, I don't remember which, um, was to deal with the on-campus stuff. And, uh, and that, that was fun. And it was, it was really fun to see the bigger picture for the, you know, the whole college. Um, I wasn't totally ignorant of it from going to dean's meetings, but, but uh, to see it from the inside on the budget and all the rest was, was really fun. And the group that I was working with over there in the Ag Administration were just great people to work with, particularly Randy. Um, so that, that, was, that was fun, but halfway through that year, um, Chip Rutledge grabbed me and said that he absolutely had to have me take over as interim director of the Bindi Bioscience Center. So, <laughs> in the last half of 2005, oh, absolutely right. That's a good word. <laughs> yes, 2005, I I, I, for six months there, I was uh, both associate dean um, for research in the College of Agriculture and interim director of the Bindley. Um, and then the, the Bindley appointment went on until no November of those, when did I retire? About seven. <laughs> this, yeah, you know, November of 07, and uh, just a month before I, two months before I retired. Um, and, uh, and again, it was an instance where there were disagreements with the uh, principals and and they just needed a steady hand in there to to keep things running. Avoid the rocking. Yeah, exactly. And I guess I'm viewed as calm and collective. There are some people that have that art and <laughs> they're treasured and valued. <laughs> but now I want to ask you, um, the Indiana University School of Medicine, you were an adjunct professor mm -hmm. in that program, or do we share some things with that? And I should tell you also, I have interviewed, one of the people I've interviewed is Dr. Lindley Wagner. Yeah, so, um, right. And, uh, and I, I picked up other, I know there were others that served on that. So sure. That's what I was asking. Well, um, and you did it for quite a, for a while. The, the program right. started in 72, 71. Mm -hmm. Lindley probably told you the exact year. So five, six years before I came here. Mm -hmm. um, it was modeled on one that I knew well from Seattle because um, mm -hmm. uh, the University of Washington Medical School at that time, I don't know if it still is or not, was the only full s s medical school in four states, Alaska, Idaho, 
Washington and Montana. And that means you've got eight senators in the U.S. Congress, which means you've got a hell of a lot of clout. And Warren G. Magnuson was from the Washington. senator from Washington who had uh, himself a lot of clout. And <laughs> so that Washington, uh, the University of Washington Medical School is one of the top medical schools, even though it was only started in 1950. Um, and if you look at the NIH funding, for instance, they're always in the top five. And um, so it's an excellent place, but they've got a huge problem out in those four states that there are thousands and thousands of square miles of territory with very few people in them. And getting docks into those places is not easy. Um, and the students go to Seattle to medical school and they want to stay right there in the Puget Sound area because it's nice and not out in the wilds of Alaska or Montana or even wa Eastern Washington for that matter. So they started a program called WAMI, Washington, Alaska, Montana, Idaho, that distributed the medical education, and particularly the first two years, out to the universities in those states. And this program in Indiana is modeled on that model. So we've got nine centers, including Indianapolis, but Bloomington and Evansville and Terre Haute and Muncie and Notre Dame and uh, Fort Wayne and here. And the way that they set it up here was to, um, in effect, hire faculty from the departments within the university to teach the medical students. And so. I was one that Don wanted me to teach medical students, and so I t taught medical students the whole time I was here. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, we have a small class, 16 students, um, and their first and second year medical education is, is done here. And then they move mostly to Indianapolis for their preclinical training. Mm -hmm. And it's fun. It's, right. yeah. Dr. Baring was involved in that. And he yes. was the associate dean, and then, of course, it was mm -hmm. already here, I believe, it, because he didn't come until 83 and mm -hmm. had already been oh, yeah. put in place. No, we were, we were, we'd been operating for a long time at right. that time. Right, yes, that's right. Yeah, and, right. Um, but, but he was involved with setting the program up when he was associate dean down in Indianapolis, mm -hmm. and, of course, he was dean before he came here. That's right, so. yeah, right. Mm -hmm. uh, how about diversity? Any comments on that? Also strategic planning. Okay. Um, diversity. I think in the time that I was head, I made offers. I, you know, I'd be hard-pressed now to um, even guess for sure, but I'm reasonably sure that half the offers that I made for faculty positions were to women even in the early years when there weren't that many women in the pool. Now our, our field is 50% women, so that's not, that's not a big issue anymore for us, and several of the most recent hires were women. If the woman was signal, there was no way I was going to convince her to come to small town Indiana. Uh, it just didn't happen. Um, even though the offers were good and, and competitive and all the rest, and we were really working to attract them. Um, that has eased substantially. Um, our field has not very many minorities in terms of people that are at the level where they would be considered for a faculty position. Uh, interestingly, we've trained a lot of them. And they're very successful people, blacks in particular. We've trained a few Hispanics too, but, but more blacks. And part of that is that Victor Rodwell in our department, and I hope you've talked to him. About that program he had in this uh, time. Yeah, started the MARC program, and that's grown and has university backing behind it. It's a very successful program. And that that has resulted in quite a few of the participants coming to Purdue for graduate school. And, and as I say, we've, they, they've been very successful. Um, so um, while this town isn't as diverse as it could be, um, 
I think we have really done a, a service in terms of the, the uh, national pool. And so. Do they think? Did they think it was too small? You think in the early yeah, days? Yeah, yeah, and, and it's, with the it's close to uh, Chicago. And with Indiana, with or? singles, I think they're always thinking about um, partners and. Um, and, and in the most of the time that I was head, we also did not have strong programs for um, uh, spousal hire in, in, in the university. It was pretty much left up to the department to try to scramble and find a place. Um, and now it's, it's much easier. And, and uh, we've been successful um, with uh, doing the partnerships with other departments, and, and uh, that makes a world of difference. Oh, yes, it does, absolutely. It and it's a, a good, it's a good thing the university is, is doing that. Yeah. Oh, the it's, word, the word it's, the only, it's the only way to do it. That's right, yeah. yeah. Um, you served under, that, what, Dr. Hansen would have been president when you came, and then Dr. Baring, right? Correct. And then Dr. Jeske. Mm-hmm. So each one is a little bit different. Very different. Um, I mean, the one that really, really made the impact is Jiski. I mean, that he came in saying what I have been saying for as long as I've been in major universities. Universities should not be called universities. They should be called multiversities because you've got 85 independent departments coexisting on the same piece of ground and very, very independent. Um, Jiski came in and said the walls are coming down between the colleges and, and, the, and the departments. And then he went out and raised the money to make that happen. You know, because in order to attract faculty, you have to have money. And right. it made and a facilities. huge difference. Not and, sure. you know, the Discovery Park is a gold mine. Um, and it, it also has made a big difference in the way that people look at interdisciplinary research, at, at interdepartmental um, collaborations and that sort of thing. And, uh, I am so grateful to have seen that in my career because it really was not happening up until then. And, and Purdue in particular because it's a, always been a very top-down place. Uh, you know, I went to the University of Wisconsin, which is infamous for jealously guarding faculty control of everything. And of course, that means endless committee meetings and fights and whatever else. And this has been a very top-down place. Uh, always has been. To some extent, that's a little less now than it was. But uh, uh, getting getting faculty to participate and realize that it could be beneficial to their careers uh, really took some doing. It's a huge challenge. It's a huge challenge. And, right. and uh, I really give Martin credit. I think even just driving down State Street, and I've been here a long time, just, and even I've talked to people who've been away from it for a while, and it just they, they're blown away. Yeah. Just, just going by the buildings, they're exactly. blown away. Yeah, well, I mean, one of the... Without even going into it. The first years he was here, it was a pain in the butt for me because I couldn't get home because of all of the... <laughs> <laughs> we have to live with that, right? <laughs> Construction going on. Oh, how about some awards and honors? Do you have any... And that one you mentioned earlier, which was nice. Oh, the uh, Distinguished sure Alum of my well, high school? Well, I think there are others that get that, but you know, it, it seems to be way off the radar, and, they yeah. don't rem and yeah. I think that's great. Um, well, I made Phi Beta Kappa in my junior year in college, and that's a very, very um, high honor. Uh, I've not had any uh, major um, national or international awards in terms of uh, research. My research is okay. I've published 130 papers or so, and, and I'm well recognized around the world, but administrator so much that it hasn't really been what it could have been perhaps. I don't think I'm that good at research quite honestly. Um, the, the thing that I hold the highest um, really in my career looking back I was 
asked by a colleague that I had known from uh, postdoc days. We weren't postdocs together. He, he had been in that lab just before I came there, and, and he was already at Wash U by the time I got to Seattle. So he was in St. Louis, but we got to know each other, we're good friends, and he pulled together a group of scientists in uh, the fall of 1985, and we put together a symposium program. Um, at the time, we were calling ourselves the American Protein Chemists, I think, or something like that. And we were looking at maybe making a satellite society to the Biochemistry Society. The, at that time, it was called the American Society for Biochemistry. It's now ASBMB. It's, it's American Society for Biochemistry and Molecular Biology. Um, and we met in San Diego that fall, and put to, we had our, our symposium, and then we discussed forming a a society and very quickly it morphed into no we should not go for a satellite society it should be an independent one um, we should um, commit to meeting annually uh, as a society and I'm proud that I talked I was one of the people on the program committee that talked David Eisenberg from UCLA into coming to the meeting even and he got so excited that he was very much involved with um, all of the discussions that surrounded the formation of the society and that and then he was elected the first president and it was that was really good because without him the society would have failed I'm sure but I was on council in one capacity or another for most of the 90s. Um, uh, we started meeting in 87. Uh, David was president um, till 89 and then Finn Wold from 89 to 91 and then I was the third elected president of the society. Came right when we started the journal. Which about bankrupted us too and we got through that uh, and by the time I was no longer president in 93, we were relatively secure. The meetings were going well and all. Um, and then um, our editor was my old postdoc mentor, Hans Neurath, who, when he took over, when he started the journal, in, it started publishing in January of 92, um, he would have been then... 83 years old and he had been editor of biochemistry from its founding the, the, the journal biochemistry from its founding 30 years prior till that point but the American Chemical Society decided that he was getting too old and they didn't want to risk having their editor die on them and so they eased him out and, and then he started this new journal well um, it it took off and and was is pretty successful uh, but we were always concerned about his age uh, even though he was a fine editor no no question about his capability it wasn't that but you know men in their mid 80s don't always live very much longer than that and and so there was more and more talk as the years went on in the 90s about how are we going to make that transition and Hans was a pretty forceful guy and never broached any kind of, of uh, competition and, and I was off the council when Brian Matthews, who's a distinguished professor in Oregon took over as president and I was absolutely floored. They they had decided that they were going to uh, give Hans a terminal contract um, and, and search for another editor and they, they appointed three very, very well-known scientists from around the world to do the, 
the, the search and discussion about, about who should be the next editor. And when Brian called me and said that that, that group that I didn't think really knew me all that well had strongly recommended that I take over as editor, I was floored. I thought about it a little while and decided, you know, it makes some sense because I've got good enough relationships with Hans so that we can make this work. He didn't talk to me for six months, but, but it, he was nothing but help once he got over that snip. Right. And, and so until he died, I, I kept him in the loop. And, uh, That's important. Yeah. yeah. You sense that. Yeah. And so that worked pretty well. And then I was editor for nine seasons. I, Brian has been editor since the beginning of 07. So yeah, it was nine, nine volumes. So, so given, given that, you know, I was editor for nine years of protein science. I was on the editorial board of uh, Journal of Biological Chemistry for 10 years in the 80s going into the 90s. I was department head for 20 years on the promotion committee forever. Um, yeah, I look back on it and my career has really um, been one where I've spent an awful lot of the um, thinking on things that you would call evaluative things. Uh, you know, deciding what's good enough for publication, what's good enough to be funded for grants. Tomorrow I'm going to sit on a grant panel right here for the interdisciplinary or intercampus grants that are funded uh, between IU and Purdue. Um, and so I, I think that a very large fraction of, of what I've done in my career has been along those lines of, of uh, assessing what is uh, quality and what isn't. And That's not easy to do. Um, and being able to gleam it as it's being written or whatever, can you get the message that's trying to get across right. reading into what they're, what they're writing on the paper? Sure, sure, on paper. sure. And versus conversation one-on-one. -on -one. Some people make it easier than others, and of course they're the ones that are successful. <laughs> that can well, you got to know Very that clearly right. say in a nice, succinct way what it is they're going to do and why. Um, there was one of my acquaintances, um, certainly don't know him well, but I've been in many meetings with him, and I remember him spending an evening charming my wife at a dinner. Um, his name is Gunter Blobel. He got the Nobel Prize about 10 years ago for work that was done kind of in my field. Uh, and in fact, I remember when the, those first papers came out, I didn't believe a word of it because the data wasn't very good, but he was right. Um, uh, but he said when he uh, was interviewed after he got the Nobel Prize, and it, he was quoted in Science Magazine as saying, if you as a scientist are not capable of explaining to your grandmother what you do and why it's important, maybe you don't understand it very well yourself. And he's absolutely correct. That's, now, I, you know, my farm background helps there because farmers are all over the map in terms of, of how educated they are, how easy it is to get them to understand things. And uh, so you learn a, a little bit. Um, and how you converse with them, passing your knowledge along to them at their level. At, at a level that's appropriate, yeah. That's right. Yeah, and knowing your audience, of course, is the key. And, well, knowing your audience is key to teaching, too. That's right. yeah. so. Good point. Yeah, that is. Uh, let's see, now you talk about press and associations. Community activities, you've been pretty involved <laughs> in, in a lot of those. Yeah. You're, you're the man on call. I was, I have worked those on... Those are challenges. <laughs> I've worked on many campaigns for the, Area the planning and the Democratic Party, Party <laughs> and, and I was Sonia Marjoram's representative to Area Plan, uh, which put me on the Board of Zoning Appeals automatically. Oh, wow. I spent 20 years on, on those boards. Um, 
it's fun. It's it's um, you important. You get to know the community, and you get to know people that you don't get to know if you yeah. just spend your life on campus. You know, lawyers and farmers and businessmen and developers. The bankers. Uh, not so much the bankers, oh, but wow. uh, but the developers mm -hmm. for sure. Yeah, that's true. Um, and uh, you know, it, it's really fun to be involved with that. I've been heavily involved in church. I'm a Lutheran and belong to our Savior right here on across the street from Knox Hall. Um, and in that capacity, because my wife was assistant to the bishop in Indiana and Kentucky for 20 years, if I appear on a ballot, I get elected because they recognize her name. I'm Miss, Mr. Sue Hermitson. And that put me on the board of directors of our seminary in Chicago for 10 years and was a kind of a exciting time for the church because uh, in 1987, three big Lutheran bodies merged into one to form the Evangelical Lutheran Church in America, ELCA. And I was chair of the board at, at uh, the Lutheran School of Theology at that time through that merger and of course everything changed for the seminaries at that point oh, and, sure. and uh, you know at the old Chinese curse may you live in interesting times and <laughs> uh, it's uh, oh. <laughs> really true. Um, well, the ca we're talk the uh, campus infrastructure has changed a lot. So, well we talked about Discovery Park but that's mm -hmm. changed a lot and the enrollment so there's been a lot of a lot, lot of changes. changes. Yeah. Yeah. When you first came, what was housing like in the 70s? Was that oh, there was, um, for, I think, four or five straight years, Purdue projected enrollment at X. And I think we were in the, in the low 30s at that time in terms of total enrollment, grad and undergrad. And for four or five straight years, they this is in the 70s, you in, say? In the late 70s mm -hmm. and maybe extending into the early 80s, but you'd have to go check the records mm -hmm. on that. Uh, they missed that projection by anywhere from 1,000 to 2,500 students. And suddenly in September, there's that many more students on campus than they expected, and the housing was, was awful. It was just a crisis all the time. And in those years, for the first time, Purdue students invaded, if that's the right word, Lafayette. They had never lived over there before. And it caused problems there, too. Um, and Purdue was pretty adamant that they were projecting a, a downward um, slope in terms of the high school, number of high school graduates, which of course happened. Um, but so they were not interested in building more dormitories and, and providing more on-campus housing. But it, it really caused a crunch in the community, and and uh, that affected me on the planning commission because um, sure. what happened then, of course, was developers uh, did see an opportunity, and and so we were doing quite a bit of zoning R three for for apartments around. Um, the county has grown a lot. Too. And the county has grown a lot. That, that was very steady. Um, I went on the planning commission in 80, and it, the co county growth was very, very steady at a little less than 1% a year until SIA came into town. And it almost doubled the annual growth rate, and it, it's, that's been true ever since. Mm -hmm. And of course, the same thing is happening in rural Indiana has happened up in my area. The farms have gotten much bigger, and so the population then moves to population centers, and it happens that Lafayette, West Lafayette, is where they're coming from. Right, yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. um, Chauncey Village has, has changed a lot, do you think? Sarah? Well, Chauncey Village, if you're talking about the top of the hill, um, I remember rezoning the strip mall that 
is on the south side, right at the bend there, going um, across the street from University Lutheran. Um, right. Oh, uh, yes. Uh, what, what was... Where, uh, University Spirit is... Yeah, University there. Spirit's in there, and uh, Parthenon and, and that. Um, oh, I forget the name of the developers. Um, uh, but there was a fight over the fact that they didn't provide adequate parking, which of course is true, they didn't, but they did provide some parking at least. A lot of those other businesses didn't. Um, and but, so that that has been relatively successful right from day one. But then there was um, the mess that, you know, at, from the intersection of State and River Road, east to the river was just a mess uh, until, what was it, 97 or so? It was, it, was the, it was the year that the war was going on in Kosovo. And I said at one point that West Lafayette had, had as much rubble as Kosovo because they knocked the Sears building down and they knocked down all of that junk along the south side of the road there. and started over. And Bruno had to move across Bruno the street. Bruno had to move across the street. Um, but that really made a big difference. And had that not taken place, all of the nice redevelopment that's been going on downtown Lafayette would have just taken everything out of West Lafayette. Now at least the two sides connect by way of the Myers Bridge and and the Reedley Plaza, uh, so the festivals like Taste of Tippecanoe and, and those sort of things can spill across the river. Right. So there's a sharing of them. Yeah. It's easier, yeah. and it's, it's all in one operation. Right. And, and that, that was Sonia Marjoram's vision right from the start, and Jim Reilly was mayor of the other side and, and uh, very much involved in that too. And uh, it, it's really helped both cities. That's right, exactly. How about the field, biochem in the 21st century? Any comments on that? In 40 up? years of being in biochemistry, you look back at what we could do in the 60s and 70s, at least early 70s, and it's just mind-boggling what has happened. Um, my looking back on the history of science, I wasn't present at the first one that I uh, um, well, let me start. Biochemistry really grew out of um, nutritional science. It was vitamin hunting is what it was. Um, and places like Wisconsin and the University of Connecticut back in the early years of the 20th century uh, discovered vitamins. And, and the nutrients that are involved with keeping animals and humans uh, healthy, both what we call vitamins and also the minerals that are involved, like copper and, and uh, the, you know, the, the zinc and whatever else. And that was the start of the field. There have been two major revolutions since then, in my judgment. The first one happened because of World War II. Um, and, and that was um, the, uh, at the end of World War II, radioactive isotopes became available for research purposes. And that made it possible then for biochemists to trace the pathways of nutrients and food through the degradative process and also then after you've digested it to build it back into human proteins and DNA and whatever else. And so the whole area of metabolism opened up and that was sort of at the tail end of, of it, the really new and exciting stuff when I was a graduate student. Um, most of the metabolic path pathways had been traced by that point. But 
and, and there, the technologies were becoming available to start to work with proteins effectively, uh, purify them, and the first structure of a protein, x-ray structure, was that of uh, the muscle protein myoglobin, which came out in, I think, 59. So that was before I got to college, but, but just barely. And, and then in the 60s, uh, between x-ray crystallography and some chemical techniques, it became possible to really get the detailed structure of proteins. And in fact, that's what I wound up working on in the late 60s when I was a postdoc. Um, but the big revolution then after that was recombinant DNA. Um, I mean, I became an expert with sequencing proteins in uh, the early 70s, and it lasted until about 10 or 12 years down the road, and then it was really much easier and much faster to work with DNA, which until recombinant DNA, it was just a morass. You couldn't work with DNA. It was, it was impossible. Um, and so th that was a revolution that has not ended in any sense of the word. And, and then it's progressed to the fact that now we can get the whole genome sequence of any organism that we want in very little time and very little expense. And um, where the field is going now is that we've got lots of information about what happens to glucose or palmitic acid or uh, adenosine when you eat it in your diet and how you break it down and make energy out of it and we know those pathways and we know what genes are involved in it and we've got the whole genome sequence and we can manipulate particularly in bacteria but but even in uh, higher animals now pretty well a lot of things but now we've got to integrate this all together. And we've got to be able to say, when you take a beta cell from the pancreas in a normal person, and you raise the glucose concentration outside that cell by, you know, from uh, 90 milligrams per deciliter to 130 after a meal, all these genes get activated right now. They produce this, this, and this, and this at such and such a level, and those proteins then turn over the small molecules and, and uh, change them in this way. And that integration is what they call systems biology, and we've got a long ways to go there uh, because what we know right now is isolated instances, little snapshots in various organisms in various conditions, and none of it's integrated together. So that's where we're going. That's, that's where we're going. Sounds good. Mm -hmm. Okay. And how about family? Uh, tell us a little about that. We have two, tell us, we have two children. Mm -hmm. Did any of them go to Purdue? No. Okay. Uh, well, <laughs> I guess I have to qualify that a little bit. Um, my younger daughter. You have two, gir two girls? She, I got two girls. Um, when she was at Augustana College in Rock Island, Illinois, um, had decided that she was going to do foreign quarter. They, they're on quarter system, so they're 11 weeks in the fall. And that college at that time was rotating its foreign quarter experience between Asia, South America, and Europe on a three-year cycle. She wanted to go to Asia, so she was going to do it in the fall of her junior year. And they send professors along with them and offer, I don't know, f six or so courses, maybe maybe seven, that have something to do the, with the place that they're at. And so one of the courses she was going to take was a geology course that related to uh, geological stuff in South China and Taiwan and wherever. Um, and but she wanted to get ahead uh, in uh, her major, which was English, uh, in order 
so that she could not take four courses while she was traveling, but cut it back to three. And so she was planning to stay in Rock Island that summer. And then in February she called me and said, Dad, they canceled one of the courses I need for this, you know, to get ahead on this major. It's going to be awfully expensive to just be here for one course. What should I do? I said, Gail, has it ever occurred to you that there is an accredited institution of higher learning <laughs> in your hometown? <laughs> you can come home and take courses at Purdue. You know, it, no, it hadn't occurred to her, which she did. So that's, I've got... She did attend. Yeah, two courses in English that, um, that she took while she was here that summer. Shakespeare and creative writing. And the first day in creative writing, she came home just mad. What a dumb course, you know. I can't understand what this idiot is trying to do. He took us outside and sat us down the water, alongside the water sculpture outside of Hubdy Hall. Didn't give us any instructions at all. And told us that we were going to spend our hour doing that. And just I, sitting? Just sitting and looking at the, at, the and at, the, at the mall there. I said, this is creative writing, Gail. Think about it. You know, he's trying to inspire something. And <laughs> anyway, she got A's in both courses. <laughs> but um, um, the oldest one, um, we told both of them they had to go far enough away from home so it was not convenient to come home on weekends. And the oldest one took us out of the word. She went to Concordia College in Moorhead, Minnesota, 800 miles away. But I had two sisters living in that town at that time. And so, um, and the youngest of those two sisters delivered twin daughters just before Amy started college. So she got well acquainted with babysitting and the family. Um, and she majored in communication, did a master's degree at Michigan State and her PhD at um, Colorado College in Denver. And she um, she taught on a temporary um, appointment for three years at IU Southeast in New Albany while her husband went on for an ed doc at University of Louisville. And so they lived on the southern right on the Ohio River mm -hmm. for those three years. And then when Amy went looking for a job, she was offered a job at her alma mater and also Winona State. And I advised that she'd be better off not going to her alma mater. And, and I think she's very happy where she is. And she's been, she got promoted. And, That's and nice. So is her husband also on the faculty there? He's, he's uh, on staff. Um, administrative staff for St. Mary's College, which is headquartered in Winona. They also have a, a campus in the Twin Cities. Mm -hmm. uh, but he's um, director of educational technology, so oh, educating faculty on how to use computers. Um, uh, I think I'll sign up. <laughs> and, and Gail got graduated with an English major, didn't know what she wanted to do, she was pretty sure she didn't want to go to graduate school. And in English, you know, most places take four new grad students a year, and even though she's Phi Beta Kappa, uh, she wasn't that interested. She was thinking about seminary, but hadn't really made up her mind. And in February, she called me, Dad, what would you and Mom say if I applied to the Peace Corps? I think she expected me to say, get serious, you know, you know, get on with your professional life. My response was, you can apply to anything, check it out. If you made an offer, you don't have to take it, uh, but find out if it's really for you. And so she did. And um, well, the long story is that um, the Peace Corps being government is maybe not the most efficient administrative structure there is, and um, with the, the day that they were going to decide whether she was going to get an offer or not uh, came and went, 
and she called them, and they hadn't even opened her file yet, um, which was an issue because she's got scoliosis, and it wasn't, you know, there was some medical thing, uh, things that doesn't bother her. But uh, uh, anyway, they called her five weeks before uh, graduation and said, "Yes, we want you." We want you June 5th, 11 days after graduation, in Poland. And in where? Poland. At that time, they were keeping 200 English teachers. This was 94. So Poland had shaken off the communists in 91, I think, and, and they had 200 English teachers there all the time. And my, uh, Vic Lechtenberg, my dean at the time, went over to start some ag programs at the University of uh, uh, agricultural University in, uh, in uh, Krakow um, that summer that Gail went over and he came back and told me that he had had somebody in Poland say what we need more, most of all in Poland right now is 10,000 English teachers. We'll trade you 70,000 Russian teachers even up. <laughs> That's pretty good. <laughs> so she was very welcome in, in Poland and um, she didn't speak a word of it when she went over. They they put the 55 people that went over with her in a little Lafayette-sized town uh, west of Warsaw uh, for the summer, living with a host family, each of them, and intensive training with the Polish language. And then she got assigned to a small town in southern Poland for two years to teach in a high school. Um, and came home fluent in Polish because she had no choice. <laughs> That's right. If you want to do your shopping, you better right. know how to ask for it, right? <laughs> yeah. Then she went to seminary and decided on our seminary in the second biggest Polish city in the world, two hours north of here, and uh, has used her Polish fairly frequently. Sure. She she was uh, her first church was in uh, Sheboygan and now in Milwaukee and. There's plenty of poles everywhere. That's right. Well, that's very good. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, let's see. You got uh, how about your outstanding band? I think you mentioned or Purdue tradition, maybe. Do you, have, do you have a Purdue tradition? A favorite? Favorite pr tr Purdue tradition. Well, the one that I always thought was the most. Just, just fit being a college, okay? Being a, a real college was one that Herr Baring stepped on. Have you been here long enough to remember the Kerry Quad Olympics? I never attended, <laughs> but um, you know that that just had a kind of a, a goofy appeal to it. <laughs> it uh, it was so typically college. And everybody was trying to predict what day it was going oh, to be. Oh, absolutely. That this would have been a perfect year for it. We've had a lot of evenings when... Uh, <laughs> and some nights they'd be out there waiting, and that was not the night. Yep, yep. So uh, that that one I always thought was, was funny and, and uh, just, you know, kind of had a college ring to it. Um, in a serious mode... Um, it isn't really a Purdue tradition, but Purdue is heavily involved in it. Um, quite frankly, I think it's Sonia Marjoram's baby, uh, the, uh, the Global Fest um, that's held over the... the uh, at Morton School. At Morton School right. over the Labor Day weekend is right. a fabulous thing. Nancy Tobias, I think, was also involved mm -hmm. in that, too. Well, and she and up. Sonia were like that, so... Yeah. Or well, were. Just, was, was, Nancy yeah. died, but... Yeah. Um, yeah, you know, no, that, but that, I go there, I work there it's every year. It's grown a lot. It's grown a lot, right. and, you know, it's got the nice feature that they always bring the judge in and take in another hundred citizens and, uh, you know, really says, we welcome you. Uh, you know, I, I'm close enough to immigrants. I knew one of the immigrants on either side of my family, uh, my great-grandfather, my mother's mother's father uh, immigrated from one of the islands off the western side of Norway. And 
he was still alive when I was a kid, um, and so I knew him. And my dad's mother was still alive when I was a kid, and I knew her well because she lived on the same farm as we did. Um, and you know, the immigrant story is one that is extremely powerful in this country and has made this country. And you know, the folks that resent immigrants are just fools. Uh, you know, I, a few years ago, I read. Kurt Vonnegut's last book, A Man Without a Country. And of course, he grew up in Indianapolis, and he tells in there the story of how unwelcome his German forebearers were in 1850. Because you know, mm. you know, at that time, you were supposed to be from the British Isles, and, and then there was Germans and Irish coming in and spoiling the country. and. Of course, my Scandinavian ancestors came from Sweden and Norway in between 1860 and 1905, and um, uh, and and now it's Asians and and you watch. I mean, these are the people that are really interested in their descendants becoming part of the American dream. Um, it took a generation longer in in my case because of the times uh, you know my parents were born on farms in in the late well 1915 and 1918 and, and even the 1920s were terrible for agriculture and the 30s got worse and um, so they didn't go to college but um, but they were determined that our generation was going to go to college and now, of course, you see the immigrants coming in and they make that step in one generation shorter because the resources tend to be a little better. But uh, my wife and I visited Ellis Island 10 years ago, uh, and that museum should be a required place for every American that isn't 100% American Indian because we're all immigrants okay, no. and we all came that way. And that, it, that museum is really good. Yeah, that's what I've heard. Now, any uh, now closing comments, anything that you'd like in summary like to say? Or anything, a question that I did not ask? Um, only a comment that I am very, very glad that you're doing this um, because, and, and the reason I'm glad you're doing this is that I've always felt that Purdue really has not paid any attention to its own history. It really has not. It was when I I was fairly green department head. Um, the dean at the time, Bob Thompson, hired uh, the first development officer ever for the College of Agriculture. His name was Bill Sheets, and he came over one day and said. The records to, to, to me, and said the records for undergraduate, well, bachelor's degree candidate or uh, graduates of Purdue are there. I can find them. They're in a terrible mass. They're not. They're not sorted by uh, anything that made sense, like departments. Uh, uh, they're in, but, in boxes. But he could he could find those records. He said, how would you, if you wanted to, go about finding the master's and PhD graduates? And I looked at him and I said, I'd go to the library, because <laughs> their theses are all in the library. Oh! You know, and you know, it was at that state, and this was the 80s. Purdue had only had one little bitty attempt under R. Hansen to raise private money, and it raised a few million dollars. It got Hanson Hall sort of started, but not finished by any means. And Bering's fundraising was a little more than that, but still not major league. Um, and it was really only Jishki that got to that point. And of course, if you're going to be in that business, you have to maintain contact with your graduates. And Purdue had never tried to do that. And with it, 
a lot of the history disappeared. I mean, the, the terrible tragedy for you is that Barney Axelrod had a stroke two years ago and is not capable of talking to you, but he would have been the person that you needed to talk to. Mm -hmm. And um, so... Well, that's what, when the dean started this, it's, it's to preserve and for researchers studying the history of the university because everybody contributes something and you're not going to be writing your own biography and there's just yeah. a wealth of information that can yeah. be shared. Yeah. And that's really what we're doing. But it's, mm -hmm. well, even... Even if you're not in it for your own research project, fascinating things can come out of it. And, and Purdue's got some colorful history. I mean, uh, Another thing that comes out of it is well, many people were born during the Depression. What was it like? How did I happen to yeah. come to Purdue? I was very yeah. fortunate. And that reflects on when you finally get here as a student or as a faculty mm -hmm. member. Or that is interwoven into it. But yet, you know, I can think of people, Don Carlberg, you should have talked to Don Carlberg. That guy had a wealth of information and, and a perspective that was so wise. Um, and, and then there were lots of colorful characters. Um, Harvey Wiley. You've read books about Harvey Wiley. I mean, he was the first state chemist, really. Created the FDA when he went to Washington. Um, and we claim him in our department. Chemistry claims him in that department. That's fine. Uh, we can share. Yeah, yeah. The president of Purdue at that time hated him because he was uh, <laughs> he not a bicycle. Near, he had a bicycle and he was not nearly austere enough to be a faculty <laughs> member, uh, which is good. I've always felt that's the way faculty <laughs> members should be. <laughs> he was colorful. Yeah. <laughs> um, so. Well, I do want to thank you very You're welcome. Much. And, and if if and, there's uh, something that uh, you think I can add to something you I know, will, I topical. Will keep, thank you very much. <laughs>